Would you please turn in your Bibles with me to Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1. We'll take a look at the first eight verses in a few minutes. Let me say this. This message is about the gospel message and the gospel messenger. And we, uh, we began to let you know that once again this summer we're going to have Vacation Bible School where we get to be gospel messengers. And um, I hope that's something that if you can, at all possibly can that you'll, uh, you'll take a part in. Not everyone is a teacher, but there are lots of jobs and they're all important. And um, so over the next few months, from time to time, we'll keep that before you. Um, do appreciate uh, Dawn and Meridel, who have had excellent leadership over Vacation Bible School for many years. They do an outstanding job. They make it easy for us that volunteer to work. Um, the materials are here. You'll see those probably on display. And we'll begin to uh, have opportunities for you to sign up for various uh, jobs, responsibilities. And, uh, and in the meantime, until we communicate all the details of that, uh, you certainly can see uh, Don and Meridel, and they'll be happy to talk to you. I know they will. So keep that in mind, and it really does go, uh, didn't mean to make another announcement. Uh, what I'm trying to do is to set up my message this morning, that uh, God has a message, and uh, we get to be messengers. And so let's look at Mark chapter 1. This will be the beginning of a series on the Gospel of Mark, and um, I'll begin with some background information uh, on this Gospel. The author is John, whose surname was Mark. Um, I say the author, he's the human author of Scripture. Of course, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and so the Holy Spirit moved upon those human authors, and they recorded God's Word uh, without error. But John, whose surname was Mark, is the human author of this gospel. Now, Mark was a cousin of Barnabas, and uh, you know that he accompanied Paul and Barnabas to serve them while they went out on the first missionary journey. It appears that Mark had a servant role that he played with those two men. He was a servant helper. We assume from what we read that he handled various aspects of their travel. So you might say he was sort of their travel agent, uh, went before them, went with them, and went after them to assist with the various aspects of their journeys. Now, while on that first journey, Mark quit. The Apostle Paul said that he deserted them. And uh, Barnabas then wanted to take Mark on the second journey, but Paul was totally opposed to it. Um, he objected, stating that Mark had failed to be useful on the first. And so Paul and Barnabas, these two partners in the ministry, these friends, they began to contentiously argue about whether or not Mark should uh, join them. And uh, I would assume as I look at uh, the Apostle Paul throughout Scripture, he's the very strong personality. Um, Barnabas... Uh, is a much softer personality. I'll say something about that in the middle. So probably most of the, the argument, the contention was with Paul. Um, but not, nonetheless, they argued over that issue to the point that uh, since they disagreed, they actually split up. You know, sometimes God even uses problems. He can, he can turn good things out of our problems. And so now we have two teams two gospel teams going out. Um, so Paul chose Silas to be his new partner, and then Barnabas took Mark with him on a missionary journey. Now, on that second trip, uh, Mark proved to be very valuable to the ministry, so much so that the Apostle Paul 
uh, later told Timothy, you get Mark to assist in the ministry and bring him. He is a useful partner in the ministry. Now, as a side note, I would say these things can speak something to us about second chances, don't they? Um, Paul would not have been wrong. Paul was not wrong to exclude uh, Mark. Uh, but later recognized that Mark had overcome the previous mistakes to the point of admitting that Mark eventually proved himself very valuable in the ministry. As for Barnabas, what was he called? He's called the son of encouragement. And that's that part that I mentioned earlier about his personality and who he was. And so uh, Mark was, I'm sorry, uh, Barnabas was the encourager, and he's, he's not called that for nothing. He gave Mark a second chance. I'm sure he encouraged Mark uh, to do well on his second chance in the ministry. And as for Mark, he overcame his lack of character and became useful uh, to many others, including Paul, including uh, Timothy, and we learn uh, from Peter that uh, he even assisted Peter in Peter's gospel work. Uh, Peter referred to Mark as his son, so there was a unique uh, mentorship relationship there as well. You imagine being uh, Mark with all those different personalities and all those different uh, uh, gospel leaders from Paul to Barnabas to Timothy, to, um, uh, what did I just say? Just lost my train of thought. Uh, to Peter, thank you. <laughs> thank you for that help. Uh, to Peter. Um, but I think it does say something about second chances. Have you ever been thankful to get a second chance? Have you ever been thankful to get a second chance spiritually? Um, I have. I am thankful. Um, there are two pastors in my life that gave me a second chance. I'm so thankful for those men. Uh, some of you have heard the story, but uh, my 10th to 11th grade years in high school were rebellious years. Uh, I was a thorn in the flesh to authority because that was my problem. I hated authority. I didn't want anybody telling me what to do. I figured I could run my life better than anybody, including God. And I really did believe that. And so I was a thorn in the flesh because my parents made me go to church, and my youth pastor was Mike Harding. Many of you have heard that name before. He's been here to speak. Uh, the senior pastor in that church was Bill Schroeder, who was a very busy pastor. We had a large church a large multifaceted ministry. We actually even did um, uh, television. Um, I don't know, was that called closed circuit TV back in the day? Um, so there was the Chicago Gospel Hour, um, had a Christian school, just very large ministry. So my senior pastor was very busy, had a lot of things going. But I am so thankful that in spite of that, Pastor Schroeder uh, took time out of his schedule to try to influence me, to try to help me when I was struggling uh, during those years. And so he met with me, and for a while he met with me once a week. At this time I was attending the Christian school, and uh, he'd, he'd have someone get me out of classes. That's always fun, right? It wasn't the principal, it was the superintendent calling me out of classes, and I would sit down in his office. I remember this like it was yesterday. He was a fisherman. He had a big marlin hanging on his wall, this big fish tank. And um, he was a very loving pastor that uh, did not pound on me. He should have. He could have. <laughs> I had plenty of... My youth pastor pounded on me for my rebellion. And, and it took both of those men. Uh, someone to not tolerate my rebellion when I expressed it publicly. Uh, and then someone to come alongside me and say, can I help you? And so Pastor Schroeder did that. I remember we went through the book of Proverbs together. And uh, I would have to come up with what was a theme verse to a particular proverb. And then I would t 
tell him the next week what that was. Go through Proverbs, try to pick out a theme verse. <laughs> that was tough. And um, I, I don't know if I always got it right, but he always let me think I got it right. And uh, from there, he encouraged me to study the Bible. And um, it was getting through. The Word of God was having an impact on my life. And uh, I learned as a teenager how to study the Bible because of my pastor that took the time to try to help me with that. And then in that process, uh, thank God, just prior to my senior year, I came to the point of genuine repentance and salvation. And it transformed my life. That's what salvation does, right? It transforms a life. And... Um, I had other uh, kids, young men in my class that were then an encouragement to me and um, helped me and uh, became a leader in my Christian school and eventually a blessing to my youth pastor. In fact, four and a half years later, Pastor Harding uh, made me a partner in his ministry in Michigan, asked me if we uh, would come teach, Dana and I, we'd come teach. And then uh, eventually uh, our school administrator was uh, going to move on to be a pastor and mentored me to take a school administrator role. And um, so Pastor Harding took a chance on me, and I always say he hired me in spite of knowing me as a teenager. And uh, I am so thankful for that. I'm so thankful that God is patient. Um, he is a God of second chances. Well, let me get back to uh, the background uh, information on this gospel. Evidence uh, points to the fact that Mark wrote to an audience of Roman believers, mostly Gentiles. And each gospel writer emphasizes something different about the person and work of Jesus Christ. Matthew emphasizes to us that Jesus is king. Luke emphasizes that Jesus is, was the perfect man. And John emphasizes the deity of Christ, that he is son of God. Well, Mark presents Jesus as the suffering servant. My mind goes to Mark chapter 10, verse 45, that says, The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. And it's interesting to me that Mark, who was originally a servant, reveals Jesus uh, as a servant. And again, as a side note, Mark's life shows his rise from a servant to missionaries to a gospel partner himself, and eventually is used by the Holy Spirit to uh, write the gospel. And it speaks volumes of how God can take the least of us. And if we will be faithful in the little things... Uh, he may use us to minister in greater capacities. I think we talked about that last week through, uh, through one of Jesus' parables. But again, let me get back to uh, the background. Now, in contrast to the other gospel writers, uh, in Mark's gospel, he focuses more on Jesus' actions than he does his teachings. They're there in the gospel, but he's focusing on what Jesus did, his actions. Uh, Mark does not include the genealogies and starts with Jesus' adult life. He goes right into the very beginning of Jesus' adult ministry. And with Mark's account, we see more demonstrations of Christ's humanity, uh, including the human emotion of Christ and uh, the limitations that Jesus had as a human being, as a man. And so with that, let's begin our look into Mark. And if you'll follow along with me, I will read Mark chapter 1, uh, verses 1 through 8. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in the prophets, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John came baptizing in the wilderness and preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Then all the land of Judah and those from Jerusalem went out to him and were all baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. 
Now John was clothed with camel's hair and with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And he preached, saying, There comes one after me who is mightier than I, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to stoop down and loose. I indeed baptized you with water, but he will baptize with the Holy Spirit. So we see the messenger prophesied, and I'm speaking of John, John the Baptist. Uh, we, are, uh, we were between uh, the Testaments. And what I mean by that is between the Testaments, our Old Testament and the New Testament, there was about 400 years of silence. And uh, Israel at that time was an occupied nation. Uh, Roman troops were in Jerusalem. They were in and around the temple. And the current ruler of Israel was Herod Antipas, who was loyal to Rome and disinterested in his own people, or I should say maybe indifferent to his own people. Uh, the religious leaders were called the Sanhedrin. They were divided between the Sadducees and the Pharisees. The Sadducees were liberal theologically and pro-Roman. The Pharisees were anti-Roman, and although theologically conservative, you know that they added to the Old Testament law traditions and ceremonies, and they made those on par with the law, law and they became self-righteous hypocrites. At the time, there were other religious sects that existed, and there were also these individuals called zealots, who were political radicals who plotted a rebellion against Rome. And so it's sort of in the midst of somewhat of a chaotic time that an unusual person called John the Baptist uh, comes out of the wilderness, and he's clothed in camel's hair. He wears a leather belt around his waist. And uh, although these would be sort of traditional clothes for a wilderness dweller, in this case, having come from the wilderness and speaking as a prophet, he reminds his audience of the prophet Elijah, whom they expected to come before the Messiah would come. And uh, we see that here in verses 1 to 3. Uh, I'll put this on the screen, but you have your Bibles open. Uh, some of these passages are there. In Malachi chapter 3, verse 1, the Lord announced, Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. In Isaiah 40 and verse 3, refers to the voice of one crying in the wilderness. And so right here in the beginning of the gospel, uh, Mark records those two prophetic messages, one from Malachi and the other from Isaiah. Malachi chapter 4, verse 5, speaks of sending Elijah the prophet who would come on the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Dreadful is an interesting word. Um, I, I think a better uh, translation would be awesome, although we tend to misuse the word awesome today. Everything's awesome. Uh, it is a good word, and it's a powerful word in its uh, right context. So, on the great and awesome day of the Lord. And now Mark identifies this Elijah to be John, and uh, the other gospel writers do the same. So, I want to show that to you. Hopefully, that's in a large enough font that you can read it. Uh, but I'll read it to you. Matthew 17, 10 to 13 says, And his disciples asked him, saying, Why then do the scribes say that Elijah is coming first? Jesus answered and said to them, Indeed, Elijah is coming first and will restore all things. But I say to you that Elijah has come already. And they did not know him, but did to him whatever they wished. Likewise, the Son of Man is also about to suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he spoke to them of John the Baptist. Uh, Luke does the same thing. Luke chapter 1, verse 17. He, meaning John, will also go before him, Jesus, in the spirit and power of Elijah 
to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. So he, like Elijah, became known for his bold, uncompromising stand for uh, the Word of God, even in the face of ruthless leaders. And um, as you know, John, uh, he said some things, and it resulted in his head being taken off. And so John was not afraid to uh, speak the uncompromising truth before leaders, even knowing of its potential consequences uh, to him. Uh, so here he is, John the Baptist, the forerunner of Messiah. And as quickly as he appears in the gospel, uh, he leaves. He is there to point us to the central person of the gospel, who is Jesus of Nazareth, who is Israel's Messiah, who is the Son of God. And Mark brings to remembrance that the prophets Isaiah and Malachi both foretold that immediately before the Messianic age, uh, one would come, there would be some dramatic events that would occur. So again, look at verses 2 to 3. Uh, it is written in the prophets, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. So the events that would occur um, would be first, there would be a herald of the Messiah, one that would proclaim that the Messiah is coming, the Messiah is here. Second, the Messiah himself would appear. He would come to his temple. He would announce that God had provided the means by which the sins of the people may be forgiven. And so that is the messenger prophesied. Now let's look at the message. Look at verse 1. I like how Mark states it. He says, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ the Son of God. And I like how he puts all of those titles together. The message is the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Mark goes right into uh, the narrative. He goes right into the gospel and he very quickly announces Jesus Christ. And he goes into the account of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And he is going to declare the goodest of the good news. Sorry, English teachers. I say that on purpose. He is going to declare the goodest of the good news. I don't know if you realize this, but the term gospel was used before our New Testament. The word gospel just meant good news, and it was used to announce a significant, exciting event that would have a positive impact. That would be the good news. Here's some good news. And uh, Mark, though, he uses the term evangel, which carries the idea of the best of all declarations or the most important of all the news. What Mark is to declare is the coming of John the Baptist and ultimately of Jesus of, Nar of Nazareth means that God has done something to change the affairs of the whole world. That's the misstatement of the morning. God has done something, folks, to change the affairs of the entire world. The background to declaring that good news about what God has done, again, is in Isaiah 40. And so let me show you verse 9. O Zion, you who bring good tidings, get up into the high mountain. O Jerusalem, you who bring good tidings, lift up your voice with strength. Lift it up. Be not afraid. Say to the cities of Judah, Behold your God. Isaiah foretold of a time when a herald would come and would announce the good news to God's people that Yahweh was going to establish his rule. The good news is that God's people would be delivered from their oppression. But then Mark ties that message of deliverance 
to the words of John and then the words that Jesus would proclaim. But this time, the good news includes deliverance from a host of enemies. That is from the world and the flesh and the devil from sin. And Mark now declares the good news of salvation is at hand. This news of Jesus Christ will create faith in the hearts of people who through him may repent of their sins. This news declares that God gives life to those who are dead in sin. Folks, without being silly, the goodest of the good news is what we have in the gospel. There is no better news. Mark now declares salvation is at hand. There was never and there will never be better news. Don't we need good news? We've been praying for revival for months and months. We need to understand that when we pray for revival, we ought to be praying for ourselves first. God, I need need some reviving. Do you need some reviving from time to time? Do you sometimes struggle in your spiritual life? And whatever it is that maybe sort of steals a little bit of our spiritual fervency, usually a sin that we allow in our life, and from time to time, we need to confess our sin. You know that confession of sin is actually an element even of corporate worship? Can you imagine putting that in the uh, order of service? We could. It's time, folks, for us to bow our heads and close our eyes and confess our sin. And certainly do that personally. But it's actually an element in the New Testament of corporate public worship that we confess our sins. Folks, this, we need good news. But here's the deal. We have it. I mean, I'm very political. I, I teach government. I teach U.S. history. Um, I follow the news. I know what's going on usually in our, in our world, usually in our country, sometimes in our world too. Um, and uh, there's a lot of bad news out there. But let me just tell you this. God is ordering even all these things right now that we're considering to be bad news. He is orchestrating everything to come to his conclusion. So, folks, even in the bad news, there's good news. You know what? Jesus is coming again. Jesus is coming back, and when he does, he will set everything right. And that's wonderful news. But listen, folks, we have the good news of the salvation from our sin. Let's declare that. Believer, bring this good news to those who are dying around you and shout it from the mountaintops. And I'm preaching to myself. We we need to share this message to lift it up. Don't be afraid. You have the best news ever given. And God has given you that news and it has transformed your life and now share it with someone else so that their life may be transformed. Declare it. Say to the lost, can I, can I show you God? The God of salvation. And so... We see that the messenger John is prophesied. We see the mess, what the message is. Now let's go back to the messenger himself. Let's, let's see about this John the Baptist. Mark introduces this prophesied one. And John begins the good news message. Though first proclaimed to Israel through the Old Testament prophets, is now going to be proclaimed to people everywhere. And this messenger announces that now is the time of the coming of Messiah. Messiah is coming. Messiah is here. And John's voice is heard in the wilderness of Judea, the very same place where Jesus will be baptized by John and the very same place where Jesus will be tempted by Satan. This place really has great significance. 
there is redemptive significance to this place. This is the place where Yahweh met with His people and revealed His law to them. This is the place where Isaiah, Isaiah, I'm sorry, where Israel was tempted and failed. This is where Israel lived on bread from heaven. And this is where God's people were tested to walk by faith. This is the place, a place of great significance. We see John's appearance, camel's hair, and ate locusts and honey. Again, he's a wilderness dweller. Um, you get that image in your head, though? Um, can I just say that this is not some kind of crazy religious zealot who's out there and he's got a signboard, repent, Jesus is coming. <laughs> this is not a weird individual. This is God's messenger. And uh, his appearance tells us something prophetic. Um, this is the new Elijah, if I can call him that. John looked like Elijah. John ate like Elijah. John spoke like Elijah. And now he appears and he proclaims that the Messiah is coming. The Messiah has come. And so he's a picture standing in between the Old Testament and the coming of a new. And uh, I love what Jesus said about him. It's an amazing statement. Jesus said elsewhere in Scripture, I tell you the truth, among those born of women, there is not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. We see, uh, we see John's time. Um, the Old Testament prophets prophesied uh, the great things to come. But John sees those prophecies coming to pass he sees that he's the fulfillment of those prophecies, and he personally participates in the beginning of their fulfillment. What an amazing uh, thing that God uses this man this way. But his time is brief. We see his uh, brevity. Uh, the word brevity has two meanings. One is concise and exact use of words in writing or speech, and the other is shortness of time. And both of those things are true concerning John. John was quickly superseded by the Messiah. Jesus' ministry quickly eclipses his. And uh, John himself said this, He must increase, but I must decrease. Wouldn't that be, true of a, wouldn't that be wonderful to be true of us? That we would say, Jesus, God, must increase in my life. I must decrease. That we would truly not live for ourselves, but live for the Savior. We see his end, um, not here in this passage, but John was imprisoned, subsequently beheaded by Herod at the request of the daughter of Herodias, uh, the details of which we'll look at later when we get to that passage in Mark. But let me emphasize his testimony of repentance. Verse 4 says, John came baptizing in the wilderness and preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Verse 5 says, all the land of Judah and all those from Jerusalem went out to him and were all baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. John's mission was to call men to repentance, to forsake their sin and to turn to God. Now, John's baptism is a baptism of repentance. Baptism was something that existed before Christianity. Just as I said, the word gospel was something that existed before Christianity. So was baptism. Years before Christ, Jews baptized in ritual cleansing ceremonies. John's baptism was to show one's outward confession and to illustrate true repentance, it was symbolic, a symbolic representation of one's change of mind to go in a new direction. Those being baptized by John were demonstrating a recognition of sin, 
a desire for forgiveness and a commitment, in their case, a commitment to follow God's law in anticipation of the arrival of the Messiah. And I want to distinguish John's baptism from believers' baptism today. Um, That's why I went through what John's baptism is. Uh, Jesus was also baptized by John, and that is an entirely different baptism as well, which, again, we'll look at that. That'll probably be next week uh, to look at that. Now, notice verse 7, where Mark uh, summarizes John's preaching. It says, And he preached, saying, There comes one after me who is mightier than I, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to stoop down to lose. I indeed baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. John is a herald. He is a proclaimer. He called Israel to repent and can only baptize with water. But the Messiah who will come after him will baptize in the Holy Spirit. And this baptism, again, will be considered later. From our Advent series to this message that points to the prophets of old who live hundreds of years before John and Jesus, we see their prophecies about the messianic age fulfilled in great detail. Mark's proclamation about John gives us assurance that God keeps his promises. God keeps his promises. We can trust God. You can trust God. We can trust the scriptures. Know it. Believe it. Just to see the prophecies of scripture fulfilled should give us great confidence that God's word is sure. It is true. There is no denying it. You know, folks, no matter how dire your life may seem to be, you can trust that God is there and that he is at work in your life. And he is working all things for your salvation and sanctification good. And you can trust him. God's track record of faithfulness is seen over and over and over again in Scripture. It is right before our eyes. We need to open our eyes to it. God does what He says He will do. He keeps His promises. There were rumblings in Israel that events out in the wilderness meant that Elijah the prophet had come. God was about to speak again. Silence for 400 years. God is about to speak again. And when he did, the good news about Jesus proclaimed by messengers like John and Mark brings about the very salvation promised. Folks, it is the proclaiming of the gospel that creates faith. God uses the proclamation of the gospel and then gives the gift of grace to those whom he is saving. It is that proclamation. It isn't the preaching of a law or laws. It isn't uh, some minister's clever stories that produces faith. It isn't even your mere testimony before someone that produces faith. And I'm not going to contradict what I said last week. I told you that um, if you're saved, if you've been saved, you understand the gospel enough to share it and start with your testimony. God can use your testimony, but in your testimony is the gospel message. Share the gospel message. And if people are to be saved, it will be the gospel message itself that will save men and women. And we get to be the mouthpiece. We get to be the instrument that God uses to share the message. Don't you want to be involved in that? I have an appointment this week, my office. I am excited that God bringing someone to me. That Folks, what did I, you know, we, Pastor Gocher would say this often to us, and I repeated it, I think, last week. If you will pray for God to send 
an unbeliever to you, he'll do it. One way or another, he'll do it. I dare you to pray that. God, bring a lost soul to me that I might share your gospel with them. And so God brought someone to me, and they'll be in my office, and I'm excited about the fact that, God, you brought me someone, I, I get to speak the gospel to them. And I, I get fearful just like everybody else, you know, meaning uh, not in this context because they're coming to actually hear the gospel. <laughs> That's easy, folks. But what about those times when I know someone is lost and, and God's providing an opportunity? I, I get a little bit nervous about that, don't we all? But folks, don't be afraid. Shout it from the mountains. Declare who God is and who Jesus is, the Savior that can save men from their sins. And when God gives faith in our hearts, we will not only embrace the truth, but we will also desire to live lives which are pleasing to God, and we will want to share the good news with others. Seems weird to me to talk about a favorite verse of Scripture. I've always felt that way. But we have those passages that, that God uses in our life and in our heart, and from time to time those might change. But one of my favorite verses in all of Scripture is Romans 12, 1 and 2. And folks, the Apostle Paul lays out the wonderful news of God's saving mercies. And he presents to us in Romans chapters 1 through 10 the wonderful doctrine of our salvation. And then in, in chapter 11, he goes into a doxology, all glory be to God. And that the response that God has saved you? Your response is, glory to God, I want to glorify you. But then in chapter, beginning in chapter 12, he gets very, uh, very strong in application. And he says, brothers and sisters in Christ, I implore you, I urge you based on the saving mercies of God that you present your bodies as living sacrifices to Him. God has saved you. Your life is for Him. Give your life to Him every day as a sacrifice to Him. God, I, I will live for you. I will serve you. And then verse 2, stop being conformed by this world. Stop letting your life get distracted by our culture, our sinful culture. But be transformed by the Word of God, by renewing your mind in the Word of God. And one of the ways that we're living sacrifices is we are God's messengers. Let's declare the goodest of good news. There's been no better news before. There will be no better news than the gospel. You have that news. Let's be messengers of God. Let's share that message. And we'll give you, we'll give you uh, 100 kids in June. And you can, you can do that. You might get to lead a soul to Christ. But not just VBS. What about those folks that you work with? What about your family? What about your neighbors? What about that person that, that God lays on your heart that's lost and needs a Savior, needs salvation? Let's bow our heads for prayer. Father, Lord, we thank you for this moment to, to see how the prophecies of old came true before our eyes as we look at scripture that the one that went before came and made the way opened the path for Jesus our Savior to declare the gospel of salvation to save men from their sins 
And Father, for those of us who have come to Christ in salvation, we are his learners, his disciples. We are his followers, disciples, who if you have commanded to go out and to tell others the good news that has come to us, that we would share it with others. Father, help me to be a better gospel messenger. Father, help those before me to be better gospel messengers. We pray these things in Jesus' name.